Habakkuk. Habakkuk, in the word of the Lord, we pronounce it Habakkuk, but the Jewish Hebrew pronunciation is Habakkuk. 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 And I'll just stay with Habakkuk. Okay? It's easy enough for me. That's a long, long name, isn't it? Habakkuk. Habakkuk. I don't think I've ever heard anybody name their, their children Habakkuk or Habakkuk. That, uh, I've heard a lot of people name their children after a lot of Bible people, but I don't recall anybody naming them Habakkuk or Habakkuk. Maybe it's because it's hard to pronounce and also hard to read, you know. But anyway, this minor prophet is found in the center of the judgment section. It is the minor prophets dealing with the Babylonian time frame. We looked at Nahum the last time. We were in the minor prophets. Nahum's judgment on Nineveh, Assyria, for their apostasy. About 40 years later, Habakkuk comes along, and he begins to prophesy the Babylonian captivity of Judah, for their apostasy, okay? His prophecy is around 609 B.C. It's about three years or so before the first deportation of Judah into Babylonian captivity. Okay, 609 B.C., first captivity, 606 B.C., so about three years or so before the first deportation of Judah into captivity. 609 B.C., three years after Assyria, Nineveh, Assyria was destroyed. So that gives you the time frame. So Habakkuk would have seen Nineveh destroyed, the rise of the Babylonian Empire here, and the soon captivity of Judah for her apostasy. Habakkuk is a very unique prophet in that he is going to start out his prophecy by complaining. Okay? Uh, the only people that can complain to God are those that walk with God. But even at that, that's a very dangerous thing to do, to complain to the Lord. God could just take your breath from you and send you right into eternity. Uh, but because he is a prophet of the Lord that walks with God, he will complain, but the Lord will give him uh, mercy in that complaint. So, if you look at Habakkuk, Habakkuk, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, he starts out with questions, okay? He questions, what is the Lord doing? Why is God acting like he is acting? Uh, the prophet doesn't understand God. He doesn't understand what God is doing. He doesn't understand why God doesn't act, why God isn't judging the sin of Judah. Uh, he knows God is a holy God. He cannot stand sin and deals with people who sin. But he is not seeing that uh, as a prophet. He does not see the judgment of God at this time upon the people so he is perplexed and he is discouraged and he is complaining about that there are two questions that the prophet will ask the Lord and the Lord will answer him so the first one oh Lord how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not say why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. 
for the wicked doth come pass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. We ask, God, that you would give us grace and mercy to declare it, to interpret it, to understand it. Speak to our hearts and minds today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Habakkuk means to wrestle or wrestler. It also can mean to, to embrace. Habakkuk is wrestling with his perplexity and his discouragement as to why God is not intervening and judging the wicked. It is a question in his mind that he doesn't understand because he knows that God is a holy God. The book of Habakkuk deals with the holiness of God. It is sort of like today when you see sin in the world. You see things happening all around us, evil things that are happening around us. And you ask the question, why doesn't God do anything about it? Why doesn't God stop the sin, the evil, the bad things that are happening in our world? Uh, so that is the condition that Habakkuk is in. Why doesn't God do something about all of the evil that is going on and all the sin that is taking place? That is his question, the eternal question of why God. Um, the answer is ultimately that God cannot stop a person from sinning. And you say, really? I say, yeah, that is ex absolutely correct. God cannot stop a person from doing evil or sinning. And I mean by that is if he were to stop one person from sinning, he'd have to stop everybody from sinning. If he stopped one person from committing rape, he would have to uh, stop everybody from committing rape. If he stopped one person from committing murder, he would have to stop everybody from committing murder. The deal is that he has given man a freedom of choice or free will so that man can exercise that will to do good or bad. Now, that doesn't mean that there will not be consequence for the sin because there is a judgment day that's going to come. Payday is coming someday. So that even though God cannot stop somebody from sinning, you understand I'm telling you, because He would have to stop everybody from sinning, He lets us know that judgment is going to come Payday is going to take place, consequence for sin and for the choices that men make will come when he returns. So we need to understand that. So Habakkuk is in a similar situation that we are today and uh, it's quite a dilemma when you see all the bad things happen and even sometimes things that go on in the church that uh, you don't understand. God, why don't you intervene? Why don't you take control of this situation why don't you stop this from happening in the church and uh, why don't you judge God the situation that's in the church and and uh, it really sometimes is perplexing and discouraging to see things that go on in the church as well as in the world and why doesn't God come and put a stop to all of it you know and I just gave you the reason why he can't in his sovereignty he has given you freedom of choice to do good or bad sin or righteousness and with the consequences thereof. Does that make sense to you? So Habakkuk looks at his day. He looks at Judah and the sin of the wicked people in Judah. He does not understand why God is not bringing a stop to this, why he doesn't intervene and do something about the situation. He uh, questions God. He's complaining to God. He's really not praying to God. He's more complaining to God, basically like, where are you, God? And what are you doing, God? He's questioning uh, God and God's actions and, and the ways of God. He doesn't understand that. Does that make sense to you? Now, before you get too pious and before I get too pious or self-righteous, have you ever been in your life when you ask the question, why? Or where are you, God? And why are you allowing this to happen to me? You know, I don't deserve this, God. And where are you, God? Why don't you step into this? Why don't you straighten this thing out? Why don't you fix this, God? Have you any? 
Nobody here's ever prayed like that, okay? Um, they're being mean to me, God. And you're letting them. And, and I know, God, I'm better than they are. And, and, you know, seems like their prayers are getting answered, but mine aren't. Okay, don't look at me like that. <laughs> don't look at me in that tone of voice. Here I am, God, trying to live for you and trying to serve, for you, serve you, Lord. It seems like um, I have more trouble than somebody that's in sin and ungodly. And, you know, so what are you doing, God? Where are you, God? Why are you acting like this way toward me, God? You know, why don't you do something about my enemies? Amen. So that's where Habakkuk is. Now, I know... Uh, none of you would ever pray like that, you know, but I have. And uh, the rest of you are different from me, I know that. But there are times when I just don't understand why God allows things to happen and allows people to do what they do and why don't He come in and just slap them around and, you know, deal with them and, and tell them how, you know, they're treating Pastor Carter wrong and you know, hallelujah. So anyway, I can't sleep at night, and I'm sure they're sleeping good. God, I can't sleep, but I know they're sound asleep. They don't have any problems. They don't worry about a thing, and here I am worrying about them. Can't understand. You know what I'm talking about. So I, I'm probably the only one in the whole church tonight that has ever been in that situation. You know, I said, well, won't you do something, God? Well, that's where Habakkuk was. He was very, very discouraged. It, it, it was a tough time. It was a time he didn't understand why God would allow things to continue as they were. So he brings his complaint to God. And that's really wise on the one hand to bring your complaint to God. Don't complain to everybody else. It's not going to do you any good to complain to everybody else, but to take it directly to God. Amen. Why are the wicked? Why is sin? Why is the sinner allowed to continue to do what he's doing? And it seems like the wicked are compassing the righteous. And all of these things are going on and God is not stepping in. Now, for you in America, that might not mean a whole lot. But I think if you were being persecuted by the wicked, the ungodly, you might ask the question too, Lord, I'm trying to serve you. Then why am I being persecuted? Why am I being beaten for my faith? Why am I being imprisoned? Because I love you, God, and I thought you would come and help me. I thought you would save me out of all these troubles, but you're not coming and you're not delivering. And can you imagine being in those situations where you are being beaten for the faith or being imprisoned for the faith, possibly your children being put to death right before your very eyes? And uh, maybe at that point you might say, like Habakkuk, Lord, what are you doing? Where are you, God? I don't understand. Say amen. That's where he is. Praise God. So this very discouraged prophet begins to complain to the Lord. I say, it's really not a prayer. We will see at the end in chapter 3, he gets his answers and he rejoices. So he starts out complaining, but he ends up rejoicing. Why aren't you coming, Lord? And why aren't you dealing with Judah? Why aren't you judging them? So he says, he talks about iniquity, rebellion uh, that is there. Verse 3, he's beholding grievances, and, uh, violence, all kinds of horrible things. Strife and contention, the law is slacked, judgment uh, doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceed. Is it just... Just a horrible, miserable condition that the world is in. And uh, you know today, you can look at the news and you can see the horrible condition that the world is in. All of the evil and uh, things that are taking place. And that's where he was. And so God answers him. Verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. 
Habakkuk, you don't understand what I'm doing. You're complaining that I'm not doing anything. He said, I'm going to do a work that if it were told you, you wouldn't believe it. He said, that's why I haven't told you, Habakkuk, what I'm going to do. Because if I were to tell you what I'm going to do, you wouldn't believe it. He tells him, it's sooner than you think. The judgment upon the apostasy of Judah is sooner than you think, Habakkuk. It's right around the corner. It's about three years from your day of prophecy. He's going to send, God said, I'm going to send Babylon to take Judah captive. I'm going to use Babylon to judge Judah. I'm going to use the wicked to destroy or to judge the wicked. God said, if I were to tell you that, you wouldn't have believed it anyway. That I would have taken Babylon and heathen power, a Gentile power, that is worse than Judah in its sin. Well, really not worse than Judah in its sin because Judah was required more because Judah knew God. But God is saying, I'm going to use the heathen. I'm going to use the Gentiles that don't know God, pagans that don't even know God. He said, I'm going to use them to be my rod of chastisement upon you. I'm going to use a wicked nation that's worse than you are as far as paganism is concerned to judge your paganism wow so God is letting him know I'm going to do something and, and God's letting him know I am here and I am involved and I do see what's going on and, and I'm going to act and I am in control when you don't think I'm in control and you're questioning the way I'm doing it and and how I'm doing it, God is letting him know I'm still in control. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. But you wouldn't have believed it if I told you before. But this is what I'm going to have. He said, I'm going to bring the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, into Judah because of their apostasy. Because of their departure from truth and they're turning their back on God. Just like Nahum prophesied to Nineveh because of their apostasy and turning away from God. God was going to judge them now. Next prophet Habakkuk says, Judah has apostatized away from God. God says, now I'm going to use the heathen to judge them. Wow. So Habakkuk, I'm alive. Habakkuk, I see. Are y'all with me tonight? Habakkuk, I'm going to use the Babylonian, the pagan Babylonian empire to spank my people. Whoa. Now you think about that right there. Somebody that doesn't even know God is going to be used by God to discipline apostate Judah to get their attention. Does that make sense? Now that creates another problem for Habakkuk. How can God use a heathen nation to come against his people who are better than the heathens. Well, the, the deal is that God doesn't require anything from the heathens. And I say he doesn't require anything. He doesn't require the same thing of the heathen as he requires of us because we know God. And he requires holiness from us. He expects us to live like we know him. But Babylon doesn't know him, so he doesn't expect Babylon to live holy. So God says, okay, Judah, you want idols? He said, I'll use a, an empire that's full of idols to come and take you captive into their idolatrous land so I can heal you or cure you of your idolatry. God knows how, how to use the wicked to judge the wicked. He knows how to use the heathen to spank those who are in apostasy away from him. Are you with me? To get rid of the idolatry out of us, the whole purpose is that he might save. The whole purpose is that he might save. And you'll see that. You'll see that as we get through, go through the book of Habakkuk. You will see his reason for sending the Babylonians into Judah and to taking them captive is so he could save the Gentiles and so he could save Judah as well. You will see that in just a minute. Okay? So he tells him, Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder, Marcy, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it 
be told you. For lo, I raised up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And then he describes them. He describes the Babylonians. They are terrible, dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall precede themselves. He talks about how swift they're going to move in and devour and destroy Judah. They're going to be like horses in swiftness. They're going to be like not only horses in swiftness, but they're going to be like wolves. Their horses are going to be like wolves, which means they're going to be vicious. Okay? He talks about them as being like eagles sweeping down upon Judah and taking the prey. So God is saying, all right, Habakkuk, you didn't think I was going to do anything about this? You didn't think I was, you know, aware of the situation, that I was blind to it? God says, I've already got it in the wings. I'm going to send this heathen nation of Babylon in there to destroy them. And it's going to be so swift. Horses run like horses running. And, and uh, they're going to be vicious. And they're going to be eagle, like eagles flying down and, and uh, coming upon Judah. You read these in the next verses. And the Bible says in verse 9, They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. They shall gather the captivity as the sand. And remember, God is answering his complaint. They shall scoff at kings, and the princes shall be, shall be scor a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. See, he's not going to acknowledge that the one God of the Bible is doing this. He's going to give glory to his pagan false god and declare that his God got him the victory over Israel's God. Are y'all with me here? Verse 12, the prophet with his second question. He can't believe what he's hearing. That God would do this. In fact, God had told him, he said, I'm going to do a work that if it were told you, you wouldn't believe it anyway. And, and now the prophet is in that place. He, he can't believe that God would use a heathen power to take his covenant people captive because of their apostasy from that covenant. He breaks out and he starts talking to God with another question. He's basically pleading, God have mercy. You know, it would be kind of like if God said to the United States of America, the church in America, I'm going to send the United Nations troops in and they're going to take you captive and kill two-thirds of you and leave only one-third of you to you in. So you can imagine if you heard that, how could that happen, God? How could you use the United Nations, one world government, to come and persecute the church? And so this is where the prophet is. He's in another dilemma now because God has told him he's going to do something about Judah's sin, but he can't believe that God would do it like that. See, God didn't answer him the way he thought God would answer him. This is beyond his comprehension that God would do it like that. And a lot of times when we go to God with complaints or whatever, why things aren't, Anything happening, why isn't God intervening? We have in our mind the way we would like God to do it. God says, I'm going to take care of it, but it's not going to be the way you thought. Are y'all with me today? Give God praise. So, so his question, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O oh Lord, Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O oh mighty God, Thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil. And canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest Thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest Thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? How can you do this, God? How can you use somebody that is as wicked as Babylon to come 
against your own people and they're more righteous than Babylon? Well, remember, God requires holiness from his people. You understand what I'm saying? So again, now he's perplexed. How could God use this heathen nation to come and judge Judah for her apostasy? And then the Bible says, verse 14, And make us men as the fishes of the sea, as creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net, gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. He's talking about Babylon. Therefore, they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag. Because by them, their portion is fat and their meal is plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net, net and not spare continually to slay the nations? So now, God, how can you use Babylon against your own people? How can you do it this way? Lord, you're holy. How could you use a heathen nation to discipline and judge them? How could you use a heathen nation to be a battle axe against your own people? How could you do that, God? doesn't seem fair to this man. So he lifts this question, this complaint before God. And then chapter 2, he decides, I've got to get in a different place. Because I'm blind. I, I'm blind to what God is doing. I don't understand why God would do it this way. I don't understand God's actions. I don't understand His ways. So evidently, He says, I'm blind to something. And I need to get higher. I need, I need to be able to take myself to a different place than I am. Because He says, I don't see it from where I am now. I don't get it where I am now. So I, I've got to get to a place where I can see what God is seeing. I've got to get higher than where I am here. I've, get, I've got to get higher than the material world. I've, I've got to get higher than my understanding. I've got to get higher than where I am now. And so the Bible says what he does is he goes over and he finds a watchtower. Some tower there in Jerusalem, probably on the walls of Jerusalem. And he climbs up into that high tower so he could be in a higher place, so he could see what God is seeing. So he could understand where God is coming from by allowing Babylon to come and judge his people. He doesn't understand it, so he repositions himself. Now, that's what you and I have to do. Okay, when we, because we're blind. We're blind. We, we don't see accurately. We don't see correctly until we get in a place where we see what God is seeing. Until we can get high enough above the world. Until we can get high enough above the, the material. Until we can get high enough above our blindness so that we can see in that tower we just don't understand. So Habakkuk understands, I've got to get in a place where I can see as high as God. I've got to understand. I've got to see what God is seeing. I've got to, I've got to look at what, what God is doing from His perspective. I, I can't understand it from where I am. I'm, he's too worldly. He's too, he's too close to the world. He's too close to the carnality. He's too close. To the flesh. So he says, I've got to get beyond my flesh. I've got to get beyond the world. I've got, I've got to get beyond where I am. I've got to get beyond this blindness so I can see, so I can understand. Why would God use somebody so wicked to judge his people? It's because of their apostasy, but why would he do it that way? And so in verse 1. He said, I will stand upon my watch. He set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me, what I shall answer then when I am reproved. He said, I'm going to go up in this tower, and I know that when I get there, God is going to correct me for my complaining. 
So at first I complained that he wasn't doing anything, and then God said, well, if I would have told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't have believed it anyway. And then he tells him what he's going to do, that he's going to judge, judge Judah by Babylon, and he doesn't like that. So he goes up in the tower, and he's expecting God to come down on him with heavy reproof and rebuke. But instead, when he gets up there, God gives him the answers. And the Lord answered and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Or one translation, by his faithfulness. Here's the answer. God says, this is the answer. The just shall live by his faith or his faithfulness. You can't go by what you think, you can't go by what you feel. You've got to walk by faith and faithfulness. Faith is what you believe. Faithfulness is your action to what you believe. And so God says, all right, Habakkuk. He says, you can't go by the natural. You can't go by what you feel. You can't go by. You've got to live by faith. You've got to trust God when you don't understand. The just shall live by faith. This is your answer, Habakkuk, in a time of trouble. Now, do you understand what he's saying here? Give God praise. So he's up in the tower now. And God says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. What is he saying? In that day, in that culture, the way they communicated was they would write information out on huge posters and they would hold the poster up where it can be seen okay, it's legible it was large letters they would hold it up where the neighbor could see it the neighbor would read the message on the poster and the neighbor would take off and run to his neighbor and tell his neighbor what was what was written on the poster and then that neighbor would run to his neighbor and tell his neighbor what was written on the poster and then that neighbor would run to his neighbor and tell them what was on the poster. So it was a way of communication. Amen? So that he that read it would run with the message. Are you understanding what he's saying? God is saying, write it down. Amen? Praise the Lord, church. So that the one that reads it can run with the message. What is the message? The just shall live by his faith you're just going to have to trust God you're going to have to live by faith say praise the Lord now this is written three times in the New Testament Romans 1 17 it is so powerful it's one of the most powerful statements of all the prophets the just shall live by his faith or by faith the just shall live by faithfulness, you're going to have to stay faithful to God no matter what goes on, no matter what happens, okay? In a time of trouble, in a time of God's wrath, in a time of God's judgment, this is the answer. The just shall live by faith. Continue to, to live in faithfulness to God. And so this prophet speaks one of the most important messages for this age called Christianity or the church age that was ever written it is a prophecy say amen. amen now wow wow Romans 1 please turn there I'm trying to go slow enough to communicate it to you so you'll understand the Apostle Paul 117 he says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul says, the just shall live by faith. And the book of Romans teaches you that you are saved 
You're justified by faith. Galatians 3.11. Paul writing the Galatian church, Gentile believers in Galatia, who had men, Jerusalem Jews, um, going over to Galatia and telling them, in order for you to be justified before God, you have to keep the law to be justified. Now, justification doesn't come by keeping the law or by good works. Justification comes by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and being born again. Okay? The law wasn't given to justify you. The law was to given to show you your need of a Savior and to lead you to Jesus and to be saved by what He did. The law is given to show you your need of a Savior and the law is given to condemn the wicked or to condemn sin. And it is also given, once you're justified, it's given to sanctify you. Does that make sense? But it was never given to justify man. That wasn't the purpose of it. So Galatians 3, Paul has to correct this. I'll start with verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law, that means you're trying by good works to obtain salvation from God. You believe that you can be good enough by your good works to be saved. You think you can pray enough, read the Bible enough, you think going to church or bringing your tithe is that's good enough for you to be saved that you're good enough a good enough person to be saved Galatians he says to them for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse for it is written cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them and because you violated one area of the law, that means you're condemned before God. So if you think you're good enough to go to heaven by your own good works, because you're a good person. He's letting you know tonight, that's not the way you get saved. It's not by being a good person. There's a lot of good people tonight that are in hell. There's a lot of good people tonight that are still alive that will be in hell there's a lot of good church people there's a lot of people that go to church that will be in hell because they thought that they were good enough to go to heaven but write it down amen that he that readeth may run tell him you're not saved by your good works you're saved by the word of God write it down You're saved by the word of God, not the love of God. Write it down. The just shall live by faith. You want to be saved, you're going to be saved by faith. Write it down. Amen. I'll get back to that in just a minute. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. You're not justified by your good works. You're justified in the, by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You're not even saved by the love of God. The love of God is what motivated God to die, to come in flesh and to die for our sin. You're not saved by the love of God. God loves people that are in hell tonight. So when I know God loves me, He does. That's right, but that doesn't mean that you're saved. Well, I had an experience with God. That doesn't mean you're saved. Does that make sense? Because you're not saved by experience. You're saved by the Word of God. You are a bibliocentric believer. That means you believe that you're saved by the Word of God. Christocentric believer says, well, my experience is just as good as anybody else's experience. And you can't tell me I'm saved because I'm a good person. And I believe and I have an experience. But if your experience and your belief doesn't line up with the word of God. 
you're not saved. Write it down. So that he that readeth may run, tell them. They've got to hear the word of God, the just. Shall live by his faith. There's going to be a lot of people lost who thought they were going to heaven because God loves them. A lot of people lost because they had an experience. A lot of people thought they were good enough to go to heaven. They're going to find out they're saved by the word of God. Write it down so he that readeth it may run and tell. It's the word of God. The just shall live by his faith. I was telling them in Galatians, don't think that you're going to be in heaven because of your good works, because you kept the law of God. No man is justified by the works of the law. You're justified by faith in Jesus Christ and your faithfulness to his words. Amen. Say praise God. Okay, so let's go to the next one, Hebrews. It's also quoted in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Say he. The it of Habakkuk becomes the he. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'll read it to you again, okay? For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Third time. When you're in a time of tribulation, know that he's coming back. When you're in a time of trouble, know he's coming back. When when you're in that tribulation period, know that he speaks. And know that he's coming again. And the just shall live by faith in that time called the tribulation period when you don't understand what God is doing and why God is doing it this way and why God is acting this way and he's already told us what he's going to do but I dare to say that most of us do not believe what he's told us about the horrible judgment of God that's going to come upon this world and in that time the just shall live by faith with this in mind he's coming back does that make sense to you So go back over there to Habakkuk 2, verse 2. He's up in that high place. He begins to see, he begins to hear what God is really doing. The Lord answered me and said, verse 2, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. Say, it shall speak, and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So that the it of Habakkuk becomes the he of Hebrews. Verse 37 of chapter 10 again. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He's coming back. Say amen. Amen. So when you're a time of trouble and tribulation and you don't understand what God is doing, the just shall live by faith. What you believe in him. Not your feeling. Not what you're seeing around you. Not your experience. Not what you think. But your faith in His Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we're saved by the Word of God. Not our feeling. Not an experience. Not the love of God. The love of God is what motivated Him to die for you on the cross. You are saved by the Word of God. You are a bibliocentric believer. Your experience must line up with the Word of God. Not the word of God with your experience. If your experience doesn't line up with the word of God, you won't be saved. But I had a good feeling, Pastor. I had an experience, Pastor. I know God loves me, Pastor. I know I'm going to hell, heaven, Pastor. How do you know that? Because you've obeyed that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, said Paul. Give God praise. You heard that doctrine. You heard that word. You obeyed the gospel. His death, his burial, his resurrection. You put your faith in that. 
for the forgiveness of your sins. Not in your good works, but in his death. If you were good enough to, to uh, go to heaven without Jesus dying, then he wouldn't have had to die. But nobody is good enough to go to heaven. So Jesus died for you and me in my place so I can be forgiven of my sin by his blood. I'm justified by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And from there I go on and I'm born again of the water and the spirit. That puts me in right standing with God. Not trying to keep the works of the law or trying to be good enough. The just shall live by faith, said Paul, Romans 1, 17. The just shall live by faith in Galatians 3 and verse 11. The just shall live by faith, Hebrews 10, 37 and 38, to let you know that the whole dispensation of the church age is based on faith. It's not based on good works. It's not based on the ceremonial law keeping it. It's not, it's not based on ceremonial washings. It's not based on bringing a, an animal as a sacrifice to God. It's not based on that kind of thing. It's based on faith in what he has done. The finished work of the cross. And someday, today, modern Judaism, in case you don't know it, modern Judaism, their whole doctrine is about works. Judaism, apostate Judaism today, is a works salvation. Trying to keep the law of God. Trying to be good enough in God's eyes. Okay? Amen? Well, it's, it's good to obey the word of the Lord. And it's good to do what's right. It's, it's, it's good to do good things. But that doesn't save you. So Judaism today still in their mind thinks they can be good enough by keeping the law of God in order to obtain his favor and to be saved. God is telling them. Romans 1, Galatians 3, Hebrews 10. No, you're justified by faith. In Jesus Christ. Give the Lord praise in the house. And Martin Luther, a Catholic monk, one day heard in his ear this verse came screaming to him from Habakkuk. The just shall be by, shall live by his faith. The just shall live by faith. He heard that come in his, in his ear, this Catholic monk, and he just about single-handedly, one person, just about wiped the Catholic church off the face of the earth by that one verse. He let them know we're not saved by works. We're not saved by uh, paying indulgences to get people out of purgatory. Get them out of purgatory if you give enough money, you know, you get them out early. Because everybody goes to purgatory in the Catholic faith, in, including the Pope. Everybody has to go to that place of temporary purging by fire until they can go from there after a time of suffering to heaven. Martin Luther said, that is ludicrous. The just shall, by faith, the just shall live. It's not by your works. It's not by your indulgence. It said Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith or by faith the just shall live almost single handedly remove the catholic church off the earth by that one one revelation from God well from then on he was under heavy persecution from the Roman catholic church yeah you you think about the thousands and literally hundreds of thousands of people that were, burnt, that were burned at the stake, martyred by the Catholic religion. They're no friend of yours. The just shall live by faith, said Martin Luther. He no longer was a Catholic monk when he got that revelation. And to all my Catholic friends out there, I'm not putting you down, but I'm going to tell you something. It's apostate religion, and you need to get out of it. The just shall live. By his faith. It's not by good works. Say praise the Lord. God says I've got something so much bigger in mind Habakkuk than you can ever begin to comprehend. If I were to tell you you wouldn't believe it anyway. That I'm going to send the Babylonian empire to take uh, to go in and to judge you by them. You wouldn't have believed it if I would have told you anyway. 
But God is saying, I've got even a bigger plan than you can imagine. I want to save those Babylonians. I want to save those Gentiles. Therefore, because of your apostasy against God, he said, I'm going to use Gentiles to come and discipline you and to take you into a foreign land so that there'd be a witness of the one true God to a Chaldean Babylonian culture so that a Nebuchadnezzar can come face to face with the most high God who rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. I'm, God has said, I'm going to use the dispersion of the Jews to save the Gentiles. In the book of uh, Acts, in the 13th chapter, it's so much bigger Habakkuk than you could ever begin to imagine. He said, God, the reason I'm going to tell you, the reason why I'm going to do what I'm going to do is to teach people the just shall live by faith. The whole reason he's going to do this is to save the Gentiles and to save the Jews. To get them to understand that they need Jesus. To get them to understand they need a Savior. They need Yeshua. Say amen. amen. Acts 13. Yeah, Lord. Acts 13, look at what Paul said. Now he's over in Antioch of Pisidia. There's an Antioch in Syria, but he's over in Antioch of Pisidia. He's speaking in a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue. A Jewish synagogue in Pisidia. Antioch, Pisidia. Gentile land. Jews dispersed in a Gentile land. Paul walks into the synagogue in a Gentile land, a Jewish synagogue in a Gentile land, and watch what he says. In the time of their dispersion, 38, Paul says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Who is this man? Jesus Christ the Lord. Through this man, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. He's speaking to the Jews that are in Gentile land. You get it? God said, I'm going I'm to take the Jews and put them in Gentile land, Babylon. He's got a plan. Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. He's trying to reach the Jews with the truth. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Amen. Say by him, by him all that believe are justified. That means they're in right standing with God Almighty. Amen. From all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Amen. Verse 40. Beware therefore lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Paul takes that very verse of Habakkuk, and he preaches to Jews who are dispersed into Gentile lands. And he says, if God were to tell you, you wouldn't believe it anyway. God is going to use the dispersed Jews throughout the world in their synagogues. Are y'all with me? As Paul goes in there and preaches, to, he's going to preach to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. You wouldn't believe it, Jews, if God told you that God's got a plan to save those old Gentiles. And he's going to use the dispersion to do it. Wow. The awesome wisdom of God Almighty. Habakkuk, why are you complaining? Why God's not doing anything? God said, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to cause Judah to be dispersed into Babylon. And the reason is because I want to save those Babylonians. And I want to save the Jews from their apostasy. Amen. Paul walks into Gentile territory, preaches to Jews in a Jewish synagogue about Jesus Christ and putting, his, putting your faith in him. Amen. And by the way, God is letting them know in that synagogue he's going to do a work that if we're told him they wouldn't believe it anyway. They wouldn't believe that God 
Even though the Old Testament prophesied Gentiles in the kingdom, they wouldn't believe it would happen like this. So he takes that prophecy and he becomes the foundation of Gentile Christianity. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Amen. Thank God that some of the Jews believed the gospel. And the next Sabbath day, verse 44, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Antioch of Pisidia, a Gentile area of the world with a Jewish synagogue. Gentiles want to hear the gospel. The Bible said the whole city showed up to hear Paul preach. Almost the whole city. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Those old pagans, those old heathen, ungodly idol worshipers, religious people. Verse 44, 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. These are unbelieving Jews, obviously. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, now remember, Paul and Barnabas are Jews. They waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it away from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a lot of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Paul is using that very, he, uh, back at chapter 1, verse 5. God said, I'm doing a work. If it were told, you wouldn't believe it. He's using that. He's saying, okay, in Habakkuk, that the Gentiles are coming down to take you captive. But the reason is God wants a witness in Babylon. And now Paul takes that very verse, Habakkuk 1, 5. Are you all with me? And says, this dispersion of Jews throughout the world in Gentile territories is going to be used by God to bring Gentiles into his kingdom. And if it were told, you Jews, you would not believe it. Amen. Woo! Give God praise. What a mighty God we serve. Infinite in wisdom. Isn't that amazing? Romans 11, he says, blindness in part has come, upon, has come upon the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. He's not done with the Jewish people. But right now, their blindness to Jesus being Yeshua, the Savior of the world, through His blood. They're blind to that, many of them. And so God is in the process of the program of reaching people just like you and me called Gentiles. Out of pagan church systems and I did say pagan church systems say hallelujah to the Lamb Woo. the just shall live by faith it's preached by Paul Romans 1 17 it's preached by Paul Galatians 3 11 it's preached again by Paul Hebrews 10 37 38 to let that let you know that Gentile Christianity the whole thing is based on that one revelation the just shall live by faith or by faith the just shall live it's not going by feelings it's putting your faith and trust in the Word of God the finished work of Jesus Christ and being born again of the water and the spirit not trying to be good enough to be accepted by God not going by feelings my feelings are always changing I know yours don't but mine do all the time you got to walk with my faith you got to trust him when you don't understand you got to live for him when you what are you doing God where are you God why are you acting like this God the church shall live by faith 
You're going to be saved by faith. In the finished work of Jesus Christ. All the New Testament, all New Testament Christianity is based on that. You receive the Holy Ghost by faith. You get baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins by faith. This is not a work of the law. This is a work of grace. Somebody say, well, if you add baptism to faith, then that's a work. It's not a work of the law. It's a work of grace. It's a work of faith. You receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost by faith. You speak in tongues by faith. You get baptized in water in Jesus' name by faith. Your sins are admitted by faith. Come on, somebody. Give God praise in this house. I'm not good enough to get the Holy Ghost. I'm not good enough to have my sins forgiven. I'm not good enough to have my sins washed away. I'm not good enough. It's by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ that I receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that I'm baptized in Jesus' name, that I'm filled with His Spirit, that I speak in tongues, that I'm forgiven of my sins. My sins are washed by His blood. Hallelujah. Read it and run. Read it and run. Read it and run. It's plain. Go tell somebody. God wants to fill them with the Holy Ghost. Go tell somebody. Jesus' blood will cleanse them. Go tell somebody. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Give the Lord praise tonight. Yes, Lord, I love you today. This little prophet Habakkuk could never, never imagine God in his infinite wisdom using dispersions of the Jews in the Babylonian captivity and dispersions of the Jews later on to reach the Gentiles to save people just like you and me hallelujah give God praise in this house thank you God verse 4 Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. It's what you believe, the word of God that you live by. That's how you're saved. The just shall live by his faithfulness. Because of what you believe, you will act on what you believe. That's not a work of the law. It's faith. Paul says, I'll sh John says, uh, James says, I'll show you my faith by my faith. Works. That's a works that is produced from your salvation. Not because you're trying to be saved, but because you are saved. You show that faith that you are really saved. That you really have saving faith by the works. Your faithfulness proves your faith in God. James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. But that's not the works of the law trying to be justified. That's a works that's proving that you really are saved because you're faithful to God. So faith or faithfulness, either one of them is accurate. Faith is what you believe. Faithfulness is the life that you live because you are genuinely saved. Woo, see, now he's, he's high enough to see what God is really doing. He's getting a glimpse of what God is up to, if you will. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I mean, he was complaining. He didn't understand. He was depressed. He was discouraged. God said, I see you. I'm still here. I know what's going on. Let me tell you my plan. The just shall live by faith, church. Keep living by faith. Don't go by your feelings. Don't go by circumstances, what you see, by faith. I'm trusting in Him no matter what I feel like. No matter what I'm going through, I'm trusting in Him. Sometimes I don't feel saved, but I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. Sometimes I don't feel worthy, but I'm made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. Sometimes I'm in trouble, but the just by faith shall live. I'm going to keep living for Him until He comes back. 
watch. He will not tarry. When he gets ready to come, he's coming. Say amen. amen. And then from there, God's going to answer the dilemma of the prophet as concerning Babylon and Babylon's sins. God is telling Habakkuk, all right, I'm going to use Babylon to judge my people. Amen. amen. Now you know the whole purpose is that God might have a witness in Babylon. But the wicked Babylonians, those who refuse to come by faith. Those that live in sin, and it lists them. I don't have time to read all of them to you. But it talks about the judgment of God upon the Babylonian. So God is saying, listen, nobody's getting off. If you're an apostate and you're Jewish, judgment's coming. If you're an apostate and you're a Gentile, judgment's coming. The day of the Lord's coming upon the Gentiles who do not believe. Come on, so you better get in covenant. You better believe in Him. You better believe in the finished work. The just shall live by faith. You better walk that way. Put your trust in Him and what He's done. Come on, somebody, are you hearing me today? Because if you don't come out of that group, just living in sin, judgment's coming. The day of the Lord's coming on. The worldwide wrath of God's coming upon the Gentiles. Coming upon Babylon, Revelation 18. Literal Babylon. Revelation 17, symbolic Babylon. He said judgment's coming upon all of them. You understand what I'm telling you today? He's letting you know nobody gets off the sin. Nobody. But because he died on the cross for your sin, you can be forgiven for it. Because he took the judgment of God. Jesus Christ took the judgment of God upon his body when he died for you. That's what brings forgiveness of sin. But Habakkuk, Babylon will be destroyed. Or Babylon will be judged as well. The Medo Persians are going to come in. Babylon, then the Medo Persians. The Medo Persians are going to overpower them. God said, I'm going to take care of that as well. But I got a big plan. A big plan to teach the world the just shall live by faith. So he lists all the sins and, and the woe of Babylon, the judgment of Babylon. Now, you need to understand in the day of Habakkuk, we got a Babylon then. We're going to have a Babylon in the future. Revelation 17, 18, symbolic Babylon. Revelation 17, that's the mystery of Babylon. That's the mother of harlots. That's a religious system. Revelation 18, that's literal Babylon. Babylon's going to be judged. You understand that? In time Babylon. Revelation 17, 18, you'll, you'll see what I'm saying. Amen. Okay? So there's far-reaching, not just the days of Habakkuk, but it's far-reaching into the end times. Now, here we go. When God judges Babylon, <clears throat> verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. The reason why he's going to allow the Jews to go into captivity in Habakkuk's day is that the knowledge of the Lord would fill the earth as the waters cover the seas. That everybody in the world will know him as the one God. And when he comes back in the end times, he judges symbolic mystery Babylon, Revelation 17, little Babylon, Revelation 18. Then he's going to come back and set up his kingdom. Habakkuk gets a vision of the kingdom of God that follows the great tribulation, the time of trouble and judgment. Habakkuk gets a vision of the kingdom of God following that time of tribulation. And he sees God, Jesus, reigning on the earth in the kingdom age. And the knowledge of the Lord filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's why he's doing what he's doing. That the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. That's why. That everybody would know him. Gentiles would know him. And Jews would know him. See him sitting on his throne in the kingdom right there in that verse. Woo, glory to God. Habakkuk seeing prophetic things that are a part of our day right now. It reaches beyond that to the time of tribulation period. 
all about the second coming of Jesus to set up his earthly kingdom. He gets a vision of that. The glory that will follow. Woo. Can you imagine? And he started out complaining. He was worried that God wasn't doing it the way he thought God ought to do. Where are you, God? Why, God? Why? Yeah. Oh, what a mighty God he is. Praise the Lord, church. <laughs> Continues to talk about the judgment upon Babylon, the verses that follow. Verse 18. What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath given graven it, and the molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake, to the dumb stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath in all, at all in the midst of it. I think you can put two and two together. This is talking about the image of the beast. It, will have, it has no life. It will appear to have life, but it, the image of the beast has no life. <laughs> you thought it did. The world thought they could put their hope and confidence in the image of the beast. But the image of the beast will not live up to its promise. God's coming back and he's going to defeat the image of the beast. He's going to defeat the Antichrist and the false prophets and the image that he set up. Come on, are y'all here today? God said it didn't have breath in it. It was just an idol, it was an image. People of the world put their confidence and their hope in the image of the God. God said, I'm going, to, I'm going to defeat that image of the beast, and then you will see me reigning in my temple, in the kingdom, when I come back. Verse 20, but the Lord, it is in his holy temple that all the earth keeps silence before him. He comes back now. Hallelujah. It has become key. He will not tarry. He will come. Just like the Bible said. Now he's come back. He's defeated the idol, the image of the beast. And he's sitting in his holy temple. And all he said, let all the earth keep silent before him. He's so awesome in his holiness. Now, now we worship God and we praise God. But sometimes there needs to be a holy hush to come over you. A reverence and a respect for this awesome God named Jesus. That he is a God of judgment. And when he returns, the whole, let the, oh, he said, let the whole earth keep silent before him. He's in his holy temple. Give the Lord praise in the house. <laughs> well, now when God's... When, when Habakkuk sees high enough, he sees what God sees. He understands what God is doing now. When he sees high enough, God's ultimate plan is that he might be known in the earth. The Gentiles would be saved by faith and Jews saved by faith. Do you understand that? Going all the way through that time of trouble and all the way through the time of trouble that's going to take place called the day of the Lord, followed by the kingdom of age and the destruction of the image of the beast. He sees all of that. When he sees this, his complaint changes to worship. When he gets God's perspective, when he gets to the right place and he gets high enough, well, what happened to him is, is a call to us. Every one of us need to get high enough and, and we need to get God's perspective. We need to see what God is seeing. You need to change your place of complaining and So Habakkuk, something happens in him. Well, I just told you what happens in him. He understands now. Isn't God good? I mean, when he started complaining, God could have said, you dead. But God uses it to teach him prophetic 
plans of salvation for the world and judgment upon the wicked. Hallelujah to the Lamb. He's letting us know, don't apostatize in the last day. There'll be a great falling away in the last days, a great apostasy in the last day. Don't be a part of that apostasy because if you do, just like God judged Judah, he'll judge you. Just like he'll use wicked Babylon to judge an apostate church. He will use the beast, the Antichrist, to destroy that harlot in Revelation 17. Apostasize, this is what's waiting, he says, judgment. But the just shall live by his faith. Perplexity, not understanding, is a very serious thing for us because I want you to hear this tonight. Because when you get in this place where you don't understand why God is doing or not doing, when you start questioning, God, it will cause you to lose your faith. You just have to say, in that, God, I'm going to trust you. Because I'm not going to succumb to apostasy. I'm not going to give in to feelings. I'm not going to look at circumstances. I'm not going to lose my faith wondering, where are you, God? No, I know he's here. I know he sees. I know he heard. I'm in trouble, but he's God. I'm in the biggest battle of my life, but he's God. Woo, Jesus, hallelujah. I'm running out of strength, but he's God and he's my strength. Chapter 3 prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shigiono, Shigiono, and I know I missed that one, but I did the best I could, Shigiono, what that means simply is all types of song, he said it's time to sing, with a loud song. It's going to be a loud song. You're going to hear him up in that tower. Singing loud. Praise God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I do not know what the connection is, but I have a feeling that there's something about this shikino that is prophetic. I would not be surprised if we see a, a shikino in the last days play a major role. Are y'all hearing me today? Some kind of instrument that plays loud and all kinds of different music. Now, if you hear anything in the news about Shigino, say, Woo! He's not tearing, he's fixing to come. You'll never forget it because you the way I pronounce it, you can't forget it. He's fixing to break out in worship. He starts out with complaint. He ends in worship. Oh, Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Oh, Lord, revive. He has three requests of God. Three requests of God. Revive thy work in the midst of years. Lord, I know now that you're going to use Babylon to take Judah captive, but don't let the faith die. Amen. Revive thy works in the midst of years. Amen. Don't let the faith in your word die. Don't, don't let faith in you die. Amen. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of years. Make known in wrath. Make known in wrath. Give people a revelation of who you are. In that time of judgment, as you said that the knowledge of the Lord would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea, Habakkuk says, let it be, Lord, 
Let them get a revelation of your name. Let the Gentiles get a revelation of your name. Let the Jews come to faith in Jesus, their Messiah. Send a revival in the midst of the tribulation period. Let the Jews forsake their good works and turn to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Let them put their trust in Him. Let there be a revival in the midst of years. Let there be a revelation that He is God to the world and to the Jews. Let there be a revelation. In the midst of years, make known, third thing, in wrath, remember mercy. Oh Lord, we need mercy in the midst of your wrath. Don't let it be all out total wrath. Lord, but in that wrath, in the midst of that wrath, remember mercy, God. Three requests to the prophet. Revival, revelation. And mercy from God. Woo. He talks about how God came in the time of the Red Sea splitting. Way back in the way that the way that God gave victory to his people when the Red Sea opened up. He judged Pharaoh and his armies by the Red Sea. And his people went through on the Red Sea. When the prophets of the Old Testament wanted to encourage the people of God, when they were discouraged, they always went to that standard miracle. That Red Sea miracle. You can read the prophets. The Red Sea miracle. How God delivered his people and defeated the Antichrist Pharaoh. They would talk about the greatness of God. And dividing the Red Sea and saving his people. The Red Sea miracle was the standard miracle of the Old Testament to encourage the people of God. The New Testament miracle of encouraging the people of God is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I tell you tonight, he's alive. I tell you tonight, he's risen from the dead. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the gospel message. I live by that. That encouraged me to know he's alive today. He's alive in me. He's alive in you. He's alive in this, this church. No matter how dark it gets in the world, no matter how much sin, I know God is still alive. There's a remnant. In the last days, there's a remnant. It doesn't have to be a big church. It doesn't have to have big, big numbers. It don't have to be a big splash. A small number of people can have a move of God. A small number of people can know God. It's not how big. It's not in numbers. It's not in numbers. Our strength is in because we know Him. Our strength is not found in our numbers. Our strength is found in our faith in Him. Our strength is found in knowing God. Not how many know, but because they know. Say praise the Lord. You say, well, how big a church do you go to? It doesn't make any difference how big a church is. Because God is not limited to move in a big church. He can move in a small church just like he moves in a big church. The strength, our strength is that we know God. Our strength is our faith in God. You want a big splash? You can go to the big splash. That doesn't mean God's going to be in it. There's a man standing outside one day. He's just standing around pondering. Somebody walked up to him and said, what are you thinking about? He said, well, um, you want to know what I'm thinking about? He said, I'm thinking about this. He said, I'm thinking, what would it be like if all the rivers of water were in one water? And I was thinking about if all the trees in the world were one big tree. 
And I was thinking about if all the axes were one big axe. And I was thinking about if all men were one big man. And that one big man took that one big axe and cut that one big tree down and it fell in that one big water and it made one big splash. He said, that's what I was thinking about. Your strength is not in your numbers. Your strength is in God. God came from Timon. He's talking about the move of God, bringing them through the Red Sea. But in the future, God came, he said, coming to the Lord. Came from Tim, Timon. We already preached this to you and the other prophets. Timon is in modern-day Jordan. Timon. We see the coming of the Lord in Edom. Timon, Bozrah, is also a city of Edom. We see God judging, treading the Gentiles in his wrath. Obadiah, we preached it. He's going to defeat the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. Timon is in Edom. But remember, there's a little place called Selah, a little place called Petra in Edom, Jordan, that the remnant will flee to for protection. And here he comes in his second coming. He's coming from Timon. He's coming to tread upon the Gentiles, but he's coming to save his people from Petra. We've already preached it to you. Right here, over here by Israel. You already, we already showed it to you in the past. Edom, Moab, Ammon is modern day Jordan. In the time of his wrath, he's going to tread upon the Gentiles of Esau. Are you with me? Which today is many of them modern day Palestinians. And by the way, there are multitudes of Palestinians that live in Jordan. The descendants, many of the descendants of Esau are Palestinians. They're constantly at war with Israel. He's coming to tread upon the descendants of Esau, but he's coming to save his people. Are you with me? Praise God. And he's going he's to be seen way down here in Cush, Ethiopia and the Sudan underneath Egypt he's going to be seen in Medina northern Saudi Arabia when he comes in the future look God came from oh did you hear that God came who's coming Jesus so Habakkuk's letting you know that Jesus the coming one is God. God came from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Mount Paran is located on the border of Edom and Mount Sinai. And then he says, Selah. Think about it. Habakkuk says, I've seen God move. I saw him move from Timon there in Edom and I said I, I saw God move Ethiopia I saw God move Cush Ethiopia I saw God move Saudi Arabia Medin I saw God move. I saw God coming I saw God judging I saw God saving his glory covered the heavens Woo. He will not tarry. Hebrews 10, 38. He's coming. The just shall live by faith. He's coming. This world hasn't seen the last of Jesus. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. You're talking about power. Those horns are he saw his hand and he saw light coming out of his hand like horns yeah his 
brightness was the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. Speaks of power. And there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan, Ethiopia, in affliction. And the curtains of the land of Midian, Midian Saudi Arabia, did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quiet naked. According to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. He says, Selah again. See, think about it. It's a musical chord. Think about it. Think about how God can. But Selah is also the name of the city of Petra. So he's, he's moving in Edom like we see here. He's going to Petra to save his remnant. The sun, verse 11, and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spirit. That is marched through the land in indignation. That's the wrath of the Lord in time wrath. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Gentiles. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. See, he's judging, he's treading upon the Gentiles. The unbelieving Gentile nations. And he's going to save his people out of Petra. Say, save. Thou wouldest forth for the salvation of thy people. What are you doing? What you, why are you doing what you're doing to save my people? Why are you judging to save my people? Verse 13 is the, the key verse of the book of Habakkuk. Thou wouldest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation, with thine anointing. Look at it. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. Thou wentest forth for the Yeshua of thy people. He said, God came. He's letting them know this God is Yeshua. Salvation. Jesus. Salvation. For the sal even for salvation. Even for Yeshua. This is all about Jesus. Is God coming and saving his people and judging the Gentiles. With thine anointed, the Christ. He is seen as God. He is seen as Jesus, Yeshua, the Savior. He is seen as Messiah, the anointed one. Coming back in great glory and power. Judging and then setting up his kingdom. Woo. Woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. He's going to defeat the king of the north, the king of Babylon, for the end times. See, for me, as I look at it, modern day Iraq right now, Babylon is southern Iraq as I, as I look at it right now. They don't seem to be a prominent in a prominent role right now, but I'm keeping my eyes on them. Because for them to fulfill prophecy, literally, that I believe the Bible's talking about them, they're going to have to become a tremendous power in the last days. The king of the north. The, the prophet talks about the king of the north, Babylonian ruler, Assyrian ruler. It talks about the Antichrist. Whichever one this is talking about, the Bible is talking about judgment upon that wicked one. The Antichrist or the King of the North. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Selah, think about it. He's coming back in judgment. He's going to judge the Antichrist by the brightness of his coming. You see him coming in brightness and glory when he spits the clouds of glory and the church is coming back with him. 
He's coming back. He's not tarrying. He's coming back. The just shall live by faith in the time of tribulation. Live by faith. Trust him. He's coming back. He's going to come and get you, and then they're going to come back with him. And he's going to destroy that wicked one, the wicked one, by the brightness of his coming. You want to know what the world's coming to? This is what it's coming to. He is coming. Now did it strike through with his staves, the head of his villages that came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. It's taking you back to the Red Sea crossing, showing us what it's going to be like when he comes. When I heard, my belly trembled. My lips quivered. I just got through telling you and preaching it to you. Did your belly tremble? Did you feel a thing? He said, my belly trembled, my lips quivered. Did your, did your lips quiver? My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what has happened to this prophet, but when he saw and heard this, his belly trembled, his lips started quivering when he heard the voice. Rottenness entered into his bones. I don't know if he, if he uh, came down with some kind of disease. This is just the response of his body to the glory that he sees. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. He said, I'm learning. By faith, the just shall live. I'm going to rest in the day of what? Trouble. What are you going to do when trouble's everywhere? The tribulation period's upon us. What are you going to do? Rest. The just shall live by faith. If it's shaking you right now, if you're perplexed right now, if you don't understand right now, where's God right now? Why God right now? Can you imagine what it's going to be like? In that time, he's given you the answer. The just shall live by his faith. He's coming back. The it of, he, of Habakkuk becomes the he. He's coming back. He will not tarry. He's coming back. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Verse 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, Israel will cease to be a nation. Israel will go into Babylonian captivity. Israel will be scattered and dispersed throughout the world. 70 AD under Titus. The fig tree will cease to exist. Israel will cease to exist as a nation. As they are dispersed throughout the world. But Habakkuk says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Practical application, though there be total bankruptcy for everybody. You got a fig tree not producing. You got vines. You got olives. You got fields are not yielding their meat. The flocks cut up from the fold. There shall be no herd in the stall. Total, absolute bankruptcy. Yet, I will 
rejoice. Now, okay. See, your inspiration comes from the Word of God. It, your inspiration doesn't come by me giving you psychology or giving you pretty stories. Your inspiration comes by the knowledge of the Word of God. So I'm going to tell you what he's doing. He says, though everything is completely, totally bankrupt, okay, yet I will rejoice. The word, the word rejoice means to jump up and spin around in a circle. He goes from complaining in the first chapter to rejoicing and jumping up and spinning around. If you'd have walked by that tower, you'd have looked up there and you would have seen that man twirling. Jesus! God's coming. Jesus is coming. Salvation is coming. He's coming. Total bankruptcy, but yet I'm going to rejoice. He starts worshiping. He starts spinning around. He doesn't go by what he sees. He doesn't go by the circumstances of his life. He's going by faith. In the time of trouble, he's coming, rejoice, spin, sing, worship, prophet. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my Yeshua, the God of my salvation. Why? The Lord God is my strength. Not numbers. I'm not putting my confidence in numbers. God is my strength. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. you got to know this. That's why he's starting to sing and dance and rejoice because he knows that God is his strength. Yeah. And not only is God, he says, strength, but he'll make my feet like hinds feet. He'll make my feet like hinds feet, not hens feet. Hands feet. Not hen's feet so you can sit up in your roost. Hind's feet. A hind is of the deer family. He said, it makes my feet like hind's feet. That I may, may climb in my high places. He said, he makes, can you imagine this man? Habakkuk, he's climbing like a deer into the high places of God. Hind's feet, those old cloven foot, sharp hind's feet that scale the rocks and the crags and the mountains. And when he scales and climbs those high places of those mountains and those crags, he doesn't slip. He makes my feet like hind's feet. He gives me the ability to scale the heights of the mountains, the craggy rocks, and he keeps me sure-footed so that I don't slip when I'm climbing those steep places. I'm thankful tonight that the hind doesn't slip in slippery places. You won't slip in slippery places. Can you see me? Can you see me? Scaling the, the rocks like, hind, like a hind? No, you don't, do you? You don't see me. So I'm standing right here. Spiritually speaking. Do you, do you see me not slip in slippery places? It's because God is your strength. The only reason why we're able to scale the high mountains is because God is my strength. And he makes my feet like hands feet. The only reason why I'm not slipping back and backsliding, are you hearing me today? The only reason why I'm not backsliding right now is because he makes my feet like hands feet. I won't slip in slippery places. He's my God. He's the God of my strength. He's the one I look to in a time of trouble. He will make me to walk upon my high places. 
sent it to the chief singer on my string instruments. Glory to God. Lift your hands. I'm done. 